Hello, I'm Herman Everhart, the Supervisory Museum Curator at the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, back again to explore the stories behind some of the interesting artifacts in our museum collection. Those of you who have watched previous programs in this series will notice that I'm coming to you today from a new location, my office here at the Roosevelt Library and Museum. The FDR Library has entered the first stage of our phased reopening plan. And along with other museum staff, I'm now dividing my time between telework at home and work on site here at the library. The library and museum remain closed to the public at this time, but as we move into the next phases of our reopening plan, we look forward to welcoming back our museum visitors and researchers. Check our website and social media for further updates on that. Today's program will also be different from previous installments in another important way. We are going to be able to examine the actual museum artifact, not just photographs of it. During this program, I will be taking you inside a special room here at the FDR Library that visitors never get to see, the museum's processing room. That room is a working space used by the museum staff when we examine and work with artifacts. The artifact that we'll be viewing there today is one of the greatest treasures of our museum collection, something that, for preservation reasons, is rarely put on public display. It's an iconic object, one closely associated with FDR's public image in our historical memory. I'm talking about President Roosevelt's famous naval boat cloak. Here you see the President wearing the cloak in one of the best-known photographs of World War II, taken at the February 1945 Yalta Conference where FDR met with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. This is just one of a number of important wartime events where FDR appeared in this cloak, and the image of him wearing it became one that Americans then and now associate with him as our nation's wartime commander-in-chief. Here's another example of a famous meeting in which FDR is wearing the cloak. This is the president conferring with King Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia during their 1945 meeting aboard an American warship in Egypt. FDR also met with Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia during this trip, and the president's cloak is clearly visible in this photo taken while the two leaders talk on the warship's deck. We know that FDR wore cloaks like this before World War II, but it was during the war that the image of him in this distinctive garment became widely seen in the media and consequently closely associated with him in public consciousness. But what exactly is this garment? And why did President Roosevelt often use it instead of a heavy overcoat? It's certainly a very dramatic looking piece of clothing, but was it a specialty item designed just for him? Well, to begin with, the cloak was not something specifically designed for FDR. It's actually part of the standard uniform used by commissioned officers in the United States Navy from the late 1800s through the mid-20th century, and it's called a boat cloak. These illustrations from the 1941 U.S. Navy uniform regulations depict the boat cloak, a calf-length cape made of heavy black wool with a prominent black velvet collar. The officer in the illustration on the left is modeling the cloak. And here are photographs of two early 20th century naval officers wearing boat cloaks. As you can see in these photos, the cloak was fitted in the front with two knotted lengths of thick cord that were called frogs. These cords fastened together below the neck to close the cloak. Incidentally, these cloaks were part of naval officer uniforms until 1947. After 1947, the cloaks became optional wear until 2016, when the Navy removed them from their list of authorized clothing. Now, why did American naval officers use these boat cloaks? Well, the cloak was designed to be worn when a ship was moving to protect the officer from cold temperatures and to shield his uniform from the effects of ocean spray. So now that you know a bit about naval boat cloaks, we can address a bigger question. Why did FDR enjoy wearing this unusual garment, which was designed for use by naval officers, when a conventional overcoat for inclement weather was more the norm for modern American presidents? Well, several important factors explain FDR's interest in these cloaks. First, we should remember that Franklin Roosevelt had a lifelong fascination and love for the sea and ocean travel. As a boy, his imagination had been fired by the tales of ocean voyages spun by his seafaring Delano relatives, 
who were involved in the clipper ship trade with China. During his youth, young Franklin actually harbored thoughts of entering the U.S. Naval Academy. However, his parents put those ideas to rest. Their plans called for him to attend Harvard College and enter law or business. FDR followed that path, but he remained fascinated by the sea. He became an expert sailor and spent a lifetime collecting books, prints, drawings, ship models, and ephemera related to naval and maritime history, especially the history of the United States Navy. In 1913, he fulfilled his dream of serving as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, a position once held by his revered distant cousin, Theodore Roosevelt. When America entered World War I, Assistant Secretary Roosevelt was often seen aboard Navy ships and inspecting naval facilities. All of this interest in and exposure to the Navy would have made FDR very familiar with the uniforms worn by naval officers, including their boat cloaks. He would have appreciated the garment's connection to his beloved Navy and probably observed firsthand how effective it was at warding off cold, wind, and ocean spray. Two additional factors also help explain FDR's attraction to these cloaks. First, there is FDR's disability. Because the president's ease of movement was hampered by the paralysis brought on by polio, the relative ease with which a boat cloak could be put on and taken off made wearing it a convenient and attractive alternative to conventional garments. The final factor that explains FDR's use of boat cloaks is a pretty straightforward one. President Roosevelt preferred travel by sea to any other form of transportation, and he eagerly seized any opportunity to journey aboard Navy ships, which he greatly favored over air travel. Together, all these factors, love of the sea, enthusiasm for the U.S. Navy, the effects of polio, and a preference for sea travel, help explain why FDR often opted to use a boat cloak instead of an overcoat. So now that you know a bit about the history behind FDR's famous boat cloak, I think it's about time for us to see it. Here is a photo of the cloak from our museum records. And here is the actual cloak. We've been magically transported uh, to the museum processing room, the room I mentioned to you earlier in this program. This is the room where the museum staff works directly with objects. Uh, we work on preparation for exhibits. Uh, we do uh, preservation work on the objects here. So this is a very special room, um, and it's a room that the general public doesn't get to see. So you're getting a little view inside uh, the inner workings of the Roosevelt Library and Museum into a working space that's used by the staff. Um, so a couple things I want to say about the uh, naval cloak. Um, first of all, uh, FDR owned several of these. Um, we have two in the museum collection, and the National Park Service, which operates FDR's home here in Hyde Park, uh, has one additional one in their collection. Um, but this is the most important of the three, uh, and the reason is that we know that this is the cloak that FDR wore in the famous photograph taken of him at the Yalta conference uh, with, Ch with Churchill and Stalin, the one I showed you earlier in the program, and also some of the other very famous meetings that he had during World War II. So this is the most significant of the three, and we refer to it as the Yalta cloak. Um, and um, it is rarely put out on display, so you're getting a, a really uh, interesting view of it here. It isn't something that's seen very often. One thing I should mention um, also about the program here is uh, we have um, some extra lights set up for this presentation. Normally this room does not have this much lighting in it, um, but we did add lights in very briefly um, for this program so that you can get a better view of the cloak and a few other items that I want to show you during the presentation. So a few things about um, FDR's naval cloak. Um, this cloak was made in 1942 at the Naval Clothing Depot at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in Brooklyn, New York. Um, as I mentioned before, it's a heavy black wool cloak with a black velvet collar up here. And here are the knotted frogs that I mentioned earlier in the program. Um, these connect to close the cape in the front uh, when the wearer has it on. Um, the cape is in remarkably good condition, considering that it's over 75 years old uh, and was uh, subjected to wind and spray and cold temperatures on ocean voyages and also a lot of uh, meetings that FDR had uh, on land. Um, but, you know, that's the point, right? Uh, it's in good condition because it's a durable garment. Um, it's something that 
um, FDR appreciated because it did protect you against the cold and the elements and holds up very well. So after 75 years, it's still in, in wonderful condition. Now, earlier in this program, I mentioned that news photographs uh, and images of FDR in uh, this naval cloak um, during the war created a kind of connection between him and the cloak. His, 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 his image in the public mind uh, became associated with this cloak, and people thought of him, uh, they, they often would think of him wearing this cloak. And to illustrate that point, I've brought out a few other items from our museum collection that, that helped to display that uh, connection. And I've got them arranged on the table here, and we're going to take a look at those next. So this is a program about uh, a naval cape, uh, which, uh, you know, is a nautical themed object. So I, I think in keeping with the spirit of that, um, uh, bear with me as I try to show you these objects using a handheld camera. It's going to feel a little seasick at times, but um, I apologize in advance. But this is how we do it when we try to shoot from uh, a um, working space in the library. Um, the very first thing I want to show you is this a uh, print of a famous 1945 portrait of FDR by Douglas Chandor. The original portrait is in the collections of the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., and it's interesting to see that Chandor chose to depict FDR wearing his naval cloak in this portrait. The next item, bear with me here, <laughs> the next item uh, uh, is something I, I brought out because it illustrates uh, when FDR died in April 1945, many newspapers, like the Philadelphia Daily News here, featured cover photographs of the president. And often those photographs showed him wearing uh, this familiar garment. Now, earlier in the program, I showed you this photograph, a very dramatic photograph of FDR um, aboard ship wearing the naval cloak. Um, and here it is, uh, reappearing in, a, um, in an advertising uh, flyer for a documentary film on uh, Roosevelt titled The Roosevelt Story that appeared uh, several years after his death. That image of FDR on the deck, uh, again, take a look at that a sec for a second, is also reproduced here in this um, commemorative item uh, a plaque that was produced in the 1950s, and you can see very clearly that the artist here has patterned that image of FDR after the photo of him in his naval cape, and you can see the naval cape um, around his shoulders there in this plaque. The last item I brought out uh, at the end of the table here is uh, the cover of Liberty Magazine. Now, Liberty Magazine was a very popular magazine during the 1940s. And this commemorative uh, issue that they did on FDR features on the cover uh, a portrait of FDR. Once again, you can see he's wearing his famous naval cape. Now, the portrait of FDR that's reproduced here um, is a very important one. It's the famous so-called unfinished portrait of the president that artist Elizabeth Shumatov was working on at the time of FDR's death on April 12, 1945. Shumatov was among the people who were with FDR at Warm Springs, Georgia during the president's last days there in, in April 1945, and she was working on this portrait on April 12th when Roosevelt died suddenly of a massive cerebral hemorrhage. Now I'm going to finish this program by describing an important part of the story of April 12th, one that relates to FDR's boat cloak, but to do that we will need to go back to my office first. So let's head back there now. So now we are magically back in my office. A moment ago, you saw a depiction of the famous unfinished portrait of FDR that Elizabeth Shumatov was working on at the time of the president's death. FDR was sitting for this portrait in his cottage at the presidential retreat in Warm Springs, Georgia. While Ms. Shumatov was working on this portrait, she asked her assistant to take several record photographs of FDR. She intended to use those photographs later in her studio to help her finish the portrait. It turns out that those photographs, shot by her assistant the day before FDR's death, are the very last photos of Franklin Roosevelt ever taken. Shumatov had a total of five photographs taken. Three of those depict FDR in his boat cloak. These striking images illustrate the dire state of FDR's health on the eve of his death. 
They also give us a final view of him wearing a garment that had come to be closely associated with his public image. These images of FDR, embodied in Shimatov's unfinished portrait, are as important as the familiar World War II photos of him in his boat cloak meeting with world leaders in solidifying his connection to this garment in our national memory. That connection, as we have seen, was reflected in a variety of media produced during the war years, like this wartime Bond poster. And the connection continues to this day. It's not surprising to see, for instance, that two of the most prominent national and international statues of FDR depict him in his boat cloak. Visitors to London's Grosvenor Square are sure to encounter this towering statue of FDR. At the FDR Memorial in Washington, D.C., two sculptures depict the president. One shows him in his wheelchair. The other, shown here, presents him in his famous naval cloak. I hope you've enjoyed this program about FDR's Yalta cloak. You should know that this artifact will be featured in a new special exhibit titled FDR's Final Campaign that will open here when our museum reopens to the public. This will be an unusual opportunity to see this famous cloak, which is rarely placed on display. Check our website and social media for further updates on that. I will be back again soon to talk about the stories behind another interesting artifact from the museum collection. If you want to learn more about the Yalta cloak and other objects in the museum, I encourage you to take our virtual museum tour and explore our digital artifact collection. Both are available on our website.